Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and I'm here in the studio today with my second full-size solo skin-on-frame canoe build of 2021. I am super excited about this latest canoe. I feel like I'm really starting to get a handle on the sizing and the proportions for different size users in these boats. I've managed to increase the secondary stability without increasing the waterline and therefore keeping the drag to a minimum. And most importantly, I've managed to push some tumble home into the sides of the boat, which makes for a more comfortable canoe stroke and gives us some significant shaping advantages in the midsection of the canoe here. So just like all my videos, I'm gonna bring you in closer here in a minute, and we're gonna go into a lot of detail about all the most recent changes on this canoe. But before we do that, if you're new here and you don't know about us or our canoe building system, make sure you go back to the previous video in this series, which is titled First Solo Skin On Frame Canoe Build of 2021, because in that I give you a really comprehensive overview of the evolution of these canoes in our building system, which is gonna answer a lot of your questions. Because in this video, we're just gonna talk about what's different in this model versus previous canoes. So assuming you've done that, my big design goal for 2021 was to try to create a dedicated solo single blade canoe that was good enough that a serious soloist could get into it and enjoy paddling it. And it turns out that this is actually a lot harder than you would expect because a lot of the shaping variables that make a good solo canoe are constrained by what you can actually make happen in skin on frame. And so I think the best way to illustrate this is I'm just gonna pull over the whiteboard here for a second and we'll talk just a little bit about shaping and skin on frame construction and where those two things conflict in canoe design. Actually, I should say shaping constraints using our particular building system because there are other ways to build a skin on frame canoe. You can build yourself a strong back and a set of canoe molds just like you would with a cedar strip canoe and then you can laminate the individual ribs to any shape that you want and build your skin boat that way. But at some point, you've got to ask yourself that that's not going to be just as much work as building yourself a cedar strip canoe. And I think what attracts most people to my style of building is just because it's a lot faster and a lot easier. And so with the free bent system that I use, we are constrained in the shape by the shapes that we can get the wood to flex easily into. So if you look up here at the top at my very poorly made drawing, you're gonna see two simple canoe shapes. We've got this one that's a little bit boxier, which means that it's gonna be more stable, but because it has a wider water line and more wetted surface, it's gonna have a lot more drag. And then we have this one that's a little bit more rounded, which is gonna have less drag, it's gonna be faster, but it's not gonna be quite as stable. And both of these are perfectly acceptable canoe shapes. This is the shape that I make my pack canoes because people sit a lot lower in those. And this is the shape that I will often make a tandem canoe because people are sitting higher, but I don't have to worry so much about it being so wide because the paddlers are sitting towards the end where the boat's narrower so it doesn't affect the stroke so much. But when you get down into a dedicated solo single blade canoe, you've got a lot of conflicting overlapping things that you want to achieve. You want the water line to be nice and narrow so the boat is nice and fast, but you also want to have a big chunk of buoyancy right above the water line, right out here. So when you heel the canoe over, you don't just immediately tip over, but then you want to tuck back in really quick to get that gunnel width nice and narrow so you've got a really comfortable, efficient canoe stroke. And this is pretty similar to the shaping that you're going to see in most well-built modern solo canoes, and it is not an easy shape to achieve with a free bent system. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what can we achieve and is that going to be good enough? And so what I've come up with in my most recent boat is a shaping a little bit more like this. And it's kind of tricky to get there. The way that I do it is I build the canoe like this, and when it's almost completely finished, I torture it into a different shape, and then I lock that shape in with the canoe seat acting as a thwart and also with the tension of the skin. And this is something that I had to approach completely experimentally because there's no way to figure it out. And in fact, if you just try to do that with a finished frame, it still doesn't give you a true read on the finished shaping of the boat. It's really that final tightening of the skin and how it compresses around all the frame members that determines the ultimate shape that the boat's gonna be. So what I came up with on my most recent build here is a boat that is fairly rounded on the bottom. It's got a reasonably narrow waterline for this boat with me at 160 pounds and this boat being 15 feet long. I have about a 26 inch wide waterline, which is pretty good. And then 
Right above the water line, I managed to get a chunk of buoyancy out here, and it gives me enough that when I heel it over on edge, I do get some feedback, I don't feel like I'm immediately gonna tip over, and I can paddle it a little bit on edge, which is how I prefer to solo. And then I got a little bit of tumble home coming back in here. It's not the dramatic two or three inch tumble home that you're gonna see in a commercial fiberglass canoe, but we did get a couple inches overall, and I can tell you that it makes a big difference just in the feel of the boat and the comfort and the efficiency of the stroke. All right, so to show you what this looks like inside the actual boat here, it's a little bit difficult to see just because the frame is kind of mesmerizing, but what we have is a shallow arched bottom that transitions abruptly right above the waterline and then tucks back in like I just talked about for that narrower gunnel width. And the way that I achieved this is I added a global increase in length to the entire rib length formula here, which if I had just left this the way that I built it with straight sides would have resulted in a boat that was very flat on the bottom, which would have been nice and stable, but it also would have been slow. But that two-stage process of torturing the boat at the end and squeezing the gunnels inwards pulls the sides up and gets this transition a little bit above the waterline here, which gives me that best of both worlds scenario where I've got a fairly efficient hull shape, but I still have some reserve buoyancy up above it that I can count on when I heel the boat over. So the other big shaping change that I made on this canoe is that I increased the plan view asymmetry even more than I have in the past. So in my very first solo canoes, I made them wider in the stern than they are in the bow, and that extends down to the waterline shape as well. And the reason I did that is because my experience designing kayaks tells me that that shaping is going to be advantageous for paddling in quartering wave patterns and in crosswinds, and also it's gonna make the hull a little bit more efficient because it parts the water a little more gently and doesn't push quite as much waves off the bow, which is a direct reflection of energy coming off of the canoe. Now, just like everything to do with small boat design, there's always gonna be compromises. And the downside to a dramatically swede form boat like this is that any time that you've got the bow significantly lighter than the stern, it's gonna pop up more when you're heading into wind and chop, which somewhat spoils the hydrodynamics of the boat in that wave condition, and also presents more surface area to the wind, which is gonna give you more drag in exactly the situation where canoes already struggle the most. But the nice thing about a canoe as compared to a kayak is that if you already have your gear sitting in front of you while you're paddling like you would in this boat, it's pretty easy to push it even further forward to bring that bow down so it's gonna paddle better in those conditions. And also that's gonna help you turn the boat into a challenging crosswind. And I think that's the thing that I like the most about this particular boat because I always find that it's easier to sit a little bit further back and add more weight forward than it is to be sitting too far forward and trying to transfer things behind me. So if I was out on a trip in this boat, I'd probably be packing with just a single backpack like my trusty ULA circuit here with a dry bag inside, of course. It would be sitting in front of me. That way I can get to my gear really easily. It also makes a nice small table. And then if I have any challenging headwinds, I can just go ahead and push this forward to kind of trim for that condition. Also, if you're someone who likes to paddle with a dog or a small child, you could put them in front of you where you can kind of control and monitor the situation a little bit better without it significantly spoiling the trim of the canoe here. So lots of different ways to build a boat. This is just my current thinking and what I like right now. If you're someone that likes a different shape or a more symmetrical canoe, you can use this exact same system to build that as well. So those are the big shaping changes on this boat. And in a second, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of little details that I changed as well. But before I do that, I should probably just give you guys the general specifications for this particular canoe. But keep in mind, this is not as important with my canoes as it is with other canoes, because this is a building system that lets you change the boat for your personal body size and the way that you're gonna be using it. So these are just the dimensions that I chose for me at 5'8", 160 pounds for what I thought would make a good general purpose solo canoe. So anyways, this boat is 15 foot two inches long. Its maximum width is 29 inches wide. It is 28 inches wide at the gunnels and it is 26 inches wide on the waterline. It is 12 and a half inches deep in the center of the canoe. 
I don't actually remember how tall it is at the ends. So I think it's something like 17 or 15, something around there, something very similar to what you see in most solo canoes. And overall, it weighs about 32 and a half to 33 pounds with everything in it, including the seat right there. And I worked really hard to keep this canoe as light as I could. I went with white oak for the ribs and cherry for the gunnels, but I went with red cedar for everything else. I used nine ounce nylon on the skin and four coats of the two-part polyurethane. And I even used Delrin rub strips around the ends of the stems instead of brass, just to keep it as light as it possibly could be. So if you were gonna build the same size and you were gonna use, say, pine or spruce for the stringers, you might end up gaining about three or maybe even four pounds to those overall numbers. So anyways, those are the specifications for this boat, but if you're larger or if you're smaller or if you have different use requirements, you might go for a completely different size here. So why don't we come in really close and I'm just gonna show you all the little things that I changed. So for starters here, I just wanna clarify that these are the pieces that I made out of cherry, which are called gunnels in most types of canoe building. Although in skin on frame, we usually call this big framing member here the gunnel, and these are called out whales or rub rails. I just don't wanna confuse anybody and make you think that I built these giant pieces of wood out of cherry. These are red cedar, just like most of the frame, except for the ribs, which are white oak. Now, I used ash for this in the past, which is also a good choice, but ash can get a little bit grimy looking over time. My hope is that the cherry is gonna weather a little bit nicer, and it was also just really nice to work with as well. Now, just like on all my boats, I've got a little pad I mounted up here, and this is just a fair lead for the pop-up sail system that we have with these canoes. So zooming out a little bit further here, I decided to go with recurving stems on this canoe. And like I've said in the past, there's no functional advantage to this particular stem shape, and it is actually harder to build. The only reason I did it is because I did it a couple years ago on a boat and it ended up looking really cool, and I wanted that same aesthetic for this canoe. But unfortunately, I didn't sweep the shear up far enough or curve the stem far enough back to get the look that I was looking for. So all I really ended up with was a bunch of extra work for a pretty boring looking end shape here. Now, these black bands that you see wrapped around the end of the canoe here are eighth inch thick acetyl plastic, which is also known under the trade name as Delrin. And this is something I started experimenting with on my last boat. Before that, I was using brass around the ends, just like you would see on most traditional canoes. But I wanted to try acetyl because it's a lot lighter weight and it's actually a lot more abrasion resistant. So at least in theory, this should give us better protection around the ends. To my eye, it looks a little bit too modern. I really like the look of the traditional brass, so I don't know if I'm gonna stay with this, but I'm gonna be experimenting with it on the next couple boats. And I did put instructions for how to do this in the plan set in the videos. Now, the seat that I'm using here is the same seat that I use in all of my solo canoes, which is the curved laminated seat that's sold by North Star Canoes. And the reason I like this seat so much is because it's extremely strong, it's extremely well made, and it drops the paddler position about one inch lower than just a straight across seat. And I suppose you could make something like this yourself, but you're talking about at least a day of setup to make the laminating forms, and then you've got to cut all the thin pieces of wood, you've got to glue it together, you've got to staple the webbing on, and for 55 bucks, I can have this sent to my door within a week of ordering it. So for me, it's just easier to buy these than to build them. And the cool thing about this is that because it drops the seat a little bit lower, it allows me to mount it directly to the bottom of the gunnels without any long spacer blocks, which is especially important in this particular design where the seat itself is holding some of the tension of the tumble home. The only thing I don't like about this arrangement doesn't really have to do with the seat, it just has to do with how I built this canoe. I mentioned earlier that I built this canoe a little bit deeper because I felt like past canoes were a little bit too shallow for me, but I wasn't taking into account the extra depth that was gonna be added by the tumble home, and so I ended up an inch higher than I wanna be. And in a solo canoe, I like to be sitting about nine inches off the bottom because I feel like that's a good compromise height between a reasonably comfortable sitting position, but it also lets me drop down onto my knees and use this front edge as a kneeling thwart. So 
I'm gonna be using the same seat in my next canoe. I'm just gonna be building it according to the old instructions so it ends up the depth that it's supposed to be. Now, more important than the seat itself here is just the way that I chose to attach it to the canoe this time. On previous models, what I've done is glued little blocks to the inside of the gunnels and then drilled through those for the seat mounting bolts here. But on this canoe, I was a little bit nervous that that wasn't gonna be strong enough for the transverse tension of the seat holding the gunnels a little bit closer together. And so what I did was I took three eighth inch pieces of cherry and glued them in a lamination in a long block to the inside of the gunnel here. And then I just cleaned it up and shaped it later. And it didn't dawn on me until I was halfway through this that this gives me a bunch of other advantages that I didn't have before. Because of the way that the seat rails interfere with the rib locations, there's only a limited amount of spacing that you can have here. And oftentimes we're choosing compromise positions to get closest to what we think is the right position for the seat. But if you glue a long block on like this, it actually gives you two choices, one inch forward or one inch back. And that's great because even though that's not much of a distance change, if you end up screwing up one set of holes or if you wanna to try to micro adjust it later, you can slide this back. And also, if you make this longer by one rib length, suddenly you have a whole five inches, you can change it. And what I decided to do on this boat here was give myself a choice between the seat being a little bit further forward and centered in the canoe and this farther back location, which is about 10 inches behind the center line of the canoe, just because I didn't totally trust that this was a good idea. Now, having done this and seen that this is actually a pretty good balance for this boat, I think in the future what I might do is glue this on five inches further back, and then that would let me purchase a separate seat that I can put even further back in the boat in a separate set of holes in the future in case I'm gonna be paddling with a big heavy load in front of me or a dog or a small child or something like that. And beyond just the seating location here, having this extra blocking gives me more real estate to mount a variety of different accessories to the top of the gunnels. And specifically, I'm thinking this is gonna be really helpful in balancing the rowing frames that I use with these canoes. So lots of versatility in this new setup, and also it ends up being stronger. I'm really enjoying working with the Cherry. I feel like it looks a lot nicer within the, with the red cedar than the ash that I've used in the past for this application. Now, just a minor detail here, something I did on the last boat that I did on this boat as well, is instead of using T-nuts mounted directly into the bottom of the seat rails here that I can drive the bolts down into, I just decided to go with a simpler arrangement where I drill straight through and I just put a star knob on the bottom here. And I like this because it's a lot easier than trying to reach under there and ratchet on bolts every time, especially if you're putting the seat in and taking it out frequently so you can put a nesting canoe inside of here. It's not quite as simple because you've got extra pieces to lose and there's also the possibility these could loosen up. But I feel like as long as you reach under there once in a while and monitor them, this isn't a bad way to have a really easily and quickly removable seat. And then finally here, the sail rig is pretty much the same as it was on the last boat because this is the sail rig from the last boat. And I've already talked a lot about this in previous videos, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically it's just a super simple downwind or crosswind sail rig that steps off the bow that you can really quickly pop up anytime you want to catch a favorable breeze. But then if things get too hectic, you can drop it down and it just stows nice and tight out of the way where it's not going to clutter up the canoe in normal canoeing mode. And right now this setup is included in the canoe building course, but sometime mid-summer I'm actually going to break it out of the canoe building course and make it into a separate course with a bunch of updates to the design as well. That way people that aren't building my boats but still want to use this can try to put this in their own boats. All right, so those are all the latest modifications, all the things I think I got right on the shaping of this boat. Now let's talk about the things I think I got wrong. And I always like to share this because for me at least, this is the more important part of the process. I learn a lot more from the mistakes that I make than the successes that I have. And that combined with all the feedback from my students is really what drives these processes forward. So anyways, First big screw up on this boat is that I added way too much rocker. And in my defense, this isn't because I planned the frame wrong or built it wrong. It's because I was doing an experiment towards the end of the build to try to determine the effect that different skin tightening methods would have on the rocker of the boat. And this is a really important thing to understand 
because rocker is one of the biggest challenges in building any canoe or really any boat out of skin on frame because unlike other boat building technologies where the shape that you plan is the shape that you get, a skin boat is more of a living, breathing thing and it's the cumulative tension of all the framing members plus the skin that determines your finished rocker and so you have to learn how those things interact so you land at the place that you're supposed to be. Now, in this case, the experiment that I did went wrong. I planned an inch and a half of rocker into the back of this boat and two and a quarter into the bow. I ended up with about a half of an inch more than that, which is still tolerable. I can keep it going nice and straight, even with my pretty inexperienced J-stroke, but it's not what I'm aiming for. But it taught me what I needed to know to really finely tune my rockers in the future, which is gonna be another tool in the toolkit for me and my students, which I'm pretty excited about. Now, the other big mistake here was I laminated one inch too shallow of a shear. And the reason that happened is just because I wasn't paying attention, I was working too quickly, and I grabbed the wrong spacer block when I was laminating. But in this canoe, at least, it ended up being kind of a happy accident because I didn't know this canoe was gonna get so much deeper during the build process because of the tumble home that I added. So the net effect of having a shallower shear but a deeper midsection ended up putting the ends of the canoes at the height that I had planned in the first place. So not a big deal in this boat, and there's certainly no reason you can't build it this way. I just personally prefer a boat to be a tiny bit shallower in the middle, and I think that our standard shear line is a lot prettier. So those are the big mistakes here. If I was gonna build this boat again tomorrow, I really wouldn't change that much. I would try to get that rocker right. I would make it a half inch less deep in the middle here, and other than that, I think this is a good general purpose solo for someone my size. I guess final analysis as far as how it paddles on the water, I'm not the best person to judge that because I'm still very much a beginner soloist, but it feels like it has a good balance between speed and secondary stability when I heel it over. It feels like it has a decent balance between turning and tracking even though it has too much rocker. It feels reasonably controllable in the wind, even though I haven't had it out in really high winds yet, and I'm not a big fan of canoeing in a lot of wind. Um, I think generally this is probably a pretty decent solo canoe. I'm not gonna say it's a great solo canoe because I'm not really the person who can make that assessment. I'm a pretty new solo canoeist, and because of my medical issues, I can't get out on the water very much. But at least for this latest effort, this is the first solo I've built that I would feel comfortable handing to someone who is a serious soloist and think that they might be able to enjoy it. And to that point, if you are someone who is traveling through Portland, Oregon, or you live here locally, and you already have significant solo canoeing experience, please get in touch with me. I would love to loan you this or any of my other solos just to get feedback on how it paddles from an experience perspective. So, as far as what's next here, I should build the next nesting size down to fit inside of this to make sure that they're still gonna fit together with the tumble home. That may or may not happen. I'm also really interested in a canoe that was just built by one of my students that uses a very similar shaping strategy but is around 14 feet long. And my very first solo was 14 feet. Back then I decided that that was too short. But considering all the changes I've made to the shaping, I'm gonna give it another try because it is so much easier easier to find 14 foot lumber than it is to find 16 foot lumber. So if it would work out for someone my size, I think that would make a great minimalist solo single blade canoe. All right, so that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. This is one of many canoes I'm gonna be building this year. So I would think about hitting the notification bell as well so you could see the design progress as each new boat gets finished. Also, you can find us on our website, capefalconkayaks.com, where I've got skin-on-frame building courses, plan sets, and a whole bunch of free resources. And while you're there, think about checking out our student builds tab, where we've got a bunch of different blogs from people who are actively working on or have finished their skin-on-frame canoes. And I wanna give a special shout out here to Adam from Michigan, who just finished a triple nesting set for him and his family to get out on the water. And then also you can find us on Instagram at Cape Falcon Builds, where we post a daily build blog of everything we're doing here in the shop. And even if you're not normally a social media person, I would really encourage you to check that out because these YouTube videos that I make are cool, 
but they also take a lot of time and energy, which means that most of what I build doesn't even make it onto the YouTube channel at all, but all of it shows up every day in my updates on the Instagram feed. It's not something that I make any money from or anything like that. I just like it because it's a much easier way to share information with people. So anyways, I think that's it for this video. Take care, be safe on the water, and have fun building your skin boat.